Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ashna Singh. I am a research intern at the Institute of Chinese Studies. I'm pleased to welcome all present here with a special mention to our media partner, The Print. The topic for today's discussion is interpreting China's strategy on the northern borders, which examines the intricate interplay between China's actions along India's northern borders within the context of its global confrontation with the United States and its allies, with the aim to substantiate the hypothesis that these actions are strategically linked to China's broader geopolitical ambitions. The analysis will involve an in-depth assessment of China's military operations in this region, thereby shedding light upon its larger goals. It shall be posited that China utilizes India's northern border strategically to create pinch points, applying pressure on India's military capabilities to divert its focus, restrict its influence, and impair its maritime power expansion. The strategy gains significance in light of China's Indo-Pacific trade route security concerns amid escalating tensions with the United States and its allies. The speaker will argue that China may not seek to restore the status quo or uphold previous agreements, but rather intends to sporadically activate these pinch points, responding provocatively to perceived alignments between India, the United States, and their allies in the evolving global ge geopolitical landscape. The discussion will be carried out by a speaker for today's seminar, Lieutenant General Prakash Menem, um, Director of Strategic Studies Program and Professorial Fellow at the Takshashila Institution, Professor Emeritus at the Transdisciplinary University, an adjunct professor at the National Institute of Advanced Studies, Bengaluru. He's a former commandment of the National Defense College and military advisor and secretary to Government of India in the National Security Council Secretariat. His recent publications include The Strategy Trap, India and Pakistan Under Nuclear Shadow, published in 2018, and the recently released India's Road to Power Strategy in a World Adrift. He has contributed to a volume titled Non-Alignment 2.0. He also writes a column for the print. Glad to have you here, sir. Thank you. Chairing today's session is uh, Ambassador Vijay K. Nambia, who served as India's Ambassador, High Commissioner in Afghanistan, Malaysia, China, Pakistan, and Permanent Representative to the UN in New York from 2002 to 2004. He has also served as Deputy National Secu Security Advisor of India and was later appointed to serve in the United Nations Secretariat as Under Secretary General, Special Advisor to Secretary General Kofi Annan. Before I hand over to the chair, I would like to ask all <clears throat> the participants to follow certain housekeeping rules. Uh, all participants shall be muted during the presentation. Questions and uh, respective questions can be posted in the chat box during the event, or you can raise your hand during the interactive session. And after the presentation, you will be called upon to unmute yourself, or I would ask you to post the to. Uh, I will be reading out your questions posted in the chat box. Uh, that's it. I'll turn the floor over to Ambassador Nambia to continue the seminar. The floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Ashna. You've actually done most of what I thought I would do. I would do by introducing the speaker as well as giving a very short idea of the of the topic, which you've done so ably. Let me also then repeat at the risk of actually repetition, a welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Lieutenant General Dr. Prakash Menon, PVSM, ABSM, VSM, who will speak on the subject of interpreting China's strategy on India's northern borders. Obviously, uh, General Menon is an infantryman of 40 years experience, a part and has spent his life right through the entire chain of command, right up to the top. And he has, apart from that, been commandant of the National Defense College. He's been military advisor and secretary to the government of India in the National Security Council Secretariat. And he's had two postgraduate degrees uh, and a PhD. He's been also visiting professor, uh, visiting fellow at the Nanyang Technology University in Singapore. And uh, of course, as uh, uh, Ashna has said, he has several published works to his credit in, uh, especially the strategy trap, India and Pakistan under the nuclear shadow, uh, and his uh, document, India's Path to Power Strategy in a World Adrift. His association with the Takshila Institution has, of course, made that also uh, an important uh, a kind of a 
foundational kind of a institution now, among other subjects on the subject of China. The subject he has chosen today is both a familiar and a difficult one. What is the overall rationale of China's continued maintenance of its aggressive posture along our northern borders? Despite 19 rounds of core commander level talks, there has been no big breakthrough in efforts to resolve the outstanding issues between the two countries along the LAC in Eastern Ladakh. The top level meeting on the sidelines of the BRIC meeting at Joburg spoke of the desirability of moving towards disengagement of troops and de-escalation of tensions. But the interpretation of what was discussed at the meeting differs in nuance as between each side, depending on whom you're talking to. Meanwhile, we have the issues of new maps and intelligence of fresh upgradation of uh, infrastructure and capabilities by China for its military to conduct wider range of operations to counter India. All this would seem to suggest anything but a willingness on the part of the Chinese to move in the direction of disengagement or de-escalation. As uh, Ashna has mentioned in the abstract that provides, that has been provided, um, General Menon wishes to reflect on the hypotheses of what China's aggressive action on our northern border means in the context of its global confrontation with the USA and its allies. What he talks about in the northern boundary of what China creating pinch points to exert pressure is apparently to draw India's military and political energy with the aim of keeping India in a sense confined to the subcontinent and especially with a view to slowing its growth as a maritime power. India's embrace of the Indo-Pacific as a geopolitical construct and its common quest with the Western powers for an open and free Indo-Pacific poses for China what General Menon had called a substantive military threat in being, as it were. For China, the criticality of securing its trade routes in the Indo-Pacific and especially in the Indian Ocean is naturally a strategic concern in the context of its growing confrontation with the United States. In such a context, keeping India from shifting its strategic weight towards the United States in the larger geopolitical confrontation could be an important objective. China will have no intention to either restore the status quo in the northern border, nor to respect the earlier agreements, as far as I can see. Uh, this is, I mean, General Menon has said in some of his writings that India should be wary of putting itself in a position where it is seen as wanting to achieve a breakthrough on the northern border at with its back to the wall, as it were. This is also what other distinguished experts like Ambassador Ashok Kantha has been saying when he talks about the need to exercise what he calls strategic patience. But what does all this mean for the state of our preparedness on the border? And how long can we afford to allow this unstable equilibrium on our border? It's almost a disequilibrium actually to continue like this. I'm sure that these are, are questions that all of us, we are very exercised about. So I shall not stand any longer between you and the speaker. General Menon, I give you the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, ICS, for this honor and privilege. Uh, I speak from the city of Bangalore. Uh, where the weather is sublime most of the time. And uh, I actually speak on a subject which obviously has could have many views. So mine is an interpretation, comes from my own study and observation. Uh, it is therefore a subjective point of view. And to really understand and why the Chinese are doing what they are doing, probably we'll have to go first into the future and then look back, which we cannot do. So I'm 
sitting here in the present, trying to look at some of the past and then trying to see why did they do it and what for was it done. So what I'm going to adopt is actually a process by which I want to connect China's political objectives to the means that it is using, which is on the northern borders, which is primarily military force. And while looking at that connection, I'll try and bring out as to what are the political objectives first, and what are the means is it using, and how is it using it to achieve those means. For political objectives by themselves, emanate from the cloud of geopolitical forces that are shaped by China as a growing power, wanting to be number one in the world, interacting with the rest of the world, especially the US allies and its West, and then deciding for itself that the water's interests at stake and from those interests are also determined by the force of what is the prevailing state of relationships between these actors at play? Is it cooperation? Is it conflict? Is it confrontation? Is it coexistence? And of course, what is the distribution of power between these forces? How is that perceived? And what is it in actually in the real world? And how do they actually perceive the other side's power? And in the end, one of the most important factors, which I would be also would be the cultural disposition of China itself on its idea of how it is using force, what has been its proclivity of using force. And that comes from a historical cultural tradition whether has it changed, is it changing? I think we'll have to first see this and then see how these forces are distilled through the politics which is prevailing inside China and also which is part of its foreign policy when its interests can actually be seen. And when its interests are seen, what are the policies that it is adopting to protect or promote those interests. And from that comes the ends which it wants to achieve. And those ends are connected to the means that they have. And means, of course, ultimately express in political power consists primarily in terms of statecraft in the instruments of the form of economic power, military power, diplomatic power, and all these being embellished by also intelligence capability, technology capability, and information capability, or how do you influence the, the, the information realm? I think what we need to understand in the beginning itself is that the military instrument is, because of its instrumental nature, has to finally influence the mind of the decision makers on the other side. In fact, all these uh, instruments of statecraft, whether it is military, whether it's economic, or whether it is diplomatic, is about influencing the mind of the decision makers on the other side. It is fundamentally a mind game. You can apply any, any amount of power, but if you can't influence or change the minds of the people you are wanting to change, that is what political power is about, then that power obviously is not working. So the point to notice that what China is trying to achieve through the instrument, the military instrument and all the rest of the instrument is about the in the is can to be realized in the domain of the psychological. It is to be realized by 
decision making of the India's political leadership. And that's very important because if you look, and we must ask ourselves a question, why is China using, has now stepped up its military aggression and what is it trying to do? What is the objective? Why is it, what does it want to achieve with that use of the military inst instrument? And therefore, my hypothesis is that the objective of China comes not because of a bilateral issue, but because of the larger geopolitical tensions, global geopolitical tensions. And that is about between China, the US and its allies. And the question for us to ask is then, well, how was India involved? India is involved, not only because we have a common border, but because of its people, its size, its geographic size, its population, its human capital, its capacity, and its growing power. More importantly, and that is the point which I would want you to, to note, is it's also about the geographic endowment of India's peninsula, India jutting out into the Indian Ocean, through which a very large part of China's trade goes to China and energy, especially in resources from the West to the East and manufactured goods the other way around. And there is India jutting into that trade route and the larger geopolitical competition and larger geopolitical struggle is about what is taking place in the maritime arena of what we now call the Indo-Pacific. Because the, if forces can actually unite and cooperation is possible more in the maritime area than anywhere else, then it can pose, if things get worse, the greatest threat greatest strategic threat to China, other than, of course, the use of nuclear weapons. And that is what China is most worried about. It is an imagined threat. It comes from an imagination of strategic Im uh, imagination, which believes that that is possible. And therefore, what is it that they can do to safeguard it. And of course, one of the, the offshoots of that and the driver of it is China's growing naval power. Yet, it is no match to the naval power yet of the United States of America, nor of its allies. And so also of India in terms of its geographical location, because it is in the Indian Ocean that all these things have to pass, apart from the fact that we also have the Andaman Nicobar, which overlooks the Straits of Malacca. So geography is, is not on China's side in these terms. That's its eastern seaboard and its trade routes are vulnerable. China's actions, as you can see, and I spoke to you about the naval part, is about safeguarding this. China views India as a candidate, which it can either keep neutral or bring it on, in, in its, on its side, or which can tilt to the other side. So, my hypothesis is that China is now using the northern borders as pinch points or pressure points to apply small amounts of military force to keep India's 
political energy, resources, and military energy and resources sucked up through that northern border. This is part of its larger strategy of trying to keep India restricted to the subcontinent. Of course, for, for very long, for several decades, it has been using and it continues to use Pakistan as its South Pole. That will still continue. But what we see as and in parallel to its larger geopolitical confrontation is its advent into India's subcontinental neighborhood, starting with Nepal, Bhutan, Myanmar, Sri Lanka, Maldives, Seychelles, you name it, they're all around. They're not doing this just because they are in a in a position to help these out, there is a geopolitical angle to it. And fundamentally, it is aimed at India. The Maldives are going in for an election. It will be interesting to see who is going to win. I think the clouds are not in our favor. China seems to be at an advantage there. But we'll have to see. So China's my hypothesis is the, China is trying to keep India within the subcontinent, using all its neighbors against it. Why? Because it wants to slow down, retard India's growth to power. Because that power, if it grows at the speed which is unrestricted by any such things, could become a threat if India tilts or shifts its weight. Because if that happens, it is a major disadvantage for China. And therefore, what have they done? They have been the last ever since the first they decided it was that we need to have peace. And that was the time when China was biding their time, lying low, made the agreements. Quite a few of them, the last one even in, in 2013. And all this while, they were also concerned about two of the buffer zones which they, have, which they want to create, which they have annexed, Tibet and Xinjiang, developed its road communications, air communications, and over a period of time, its connectivity towards the various parts of the northern border, demarcated in most places by the LAC. So this went on for about a decade plus. And as the Global tensions increased, and as China felt that India actually needs to be slowed down, it started what we now call, it's, it normally starts with the small stuff, increase in patrolling, no, because they had people, more people there. Then it comes with patrol stay for a longer time. Then they they come and stop our patrols from going to where we use a line of control. Although all we had agreements and protocols to actually keep these in place. We had a banner drill going in which we suppose say this is India. They would say this is China, and both would then walk off. And slowly. By the early 2010s, things started changing. More face-offs were happening. It went on. Every time something had happened, we negotiated. And then they probably mostly re restored the status quo. 
but they had certainly managed to get close to the objective of drawing India's attention to the northern borders in terms of the resources that it required. <coughs> For a long time, we must admit that India's military power and its political energy were concentrated towards the West. We had an obsession with Pakistan. Even after we became nuclear powers, we continued to believe that we could go thrust deep into Pakistan and destroy the uh, Pakistani armed forces. And the game continued. And most of our military power was deployed against the Pakistanis. But as China activated the northern border, people started questioning that. And now over a period of time, there are certain movements taking place which is going, which is rebalancing India's military power from Pakistan, who in fact is not the primary adversary, is the primary adverse, potential adversary, China. That is what is the process which is now on. So the Chinese probably calculated that they can keep things in going in slow motion. Small incidents here and there. Get India to deploy more resources. In any case, India's infrastructure buildup was ongoing, but it was slow, which is now picked up uh, a much faster pace. The Chinese, meanwhile, if you just look at their airports and heliports, which they have actually created, either created new ones or upgraded it, it's impressive because it is across both Tibet and Xinjiang. And some of those airports are just about 15 to 20 kilometers, a few of them at least, from the LAC. So while India was speeded up, they created the impression that they could use military force, substantial military force, if they wanted. We were thinking that that military force, most of us, were actually being used to try and resolve the boundary issue. But in actual fact, resolution of the boundary issue, China had probably no interest in it because if you really look at it, 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 it doesn't really matter for them. But what they were using it for was to use them as pressure or pinch points, whatever you want to call them, to, uh, to get us to deploy more and more resources. Now, one of the things which probably happened, and I, 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 I must tell you that all this infrastructure buildup is not only about airports, it was about uh, garrisoning of troops. It was about military logistics, about road communications, bridges, and rail connectivity and air connectivity to the inland. So it was a complete system which had changed. The idea was that it can actually concentrate large amounts of troops in any place which he, where they sought a decision. And all this was not, they were trying to conceal. It was being done openly. They were being monitored geospatially, which is very easy to do these days. They enjoyed doing that. And we were also trying to see as to what we need to do. So then in 2017, Doklam happened. Now, in Dokla, although India stopped them from actually building the road just below Dokala, 
because we are actually part of the disputes because of the fact that the trijunction is disputed. We have a different idea of the trijunction. The Chinese have a different idea. So we must very much part of the dispute of the Doklam Plateau itself, although it's part of Bhutanese territory. But after some time, when we resolved it, and we resolved it with another meeting, which was the, which was behind us, which is ahead of us, and we, the agreement was <laughs> that this agreement only pertained to the area of where the face off or where we had blocked it, not of the complete Doklam plateau itself. So in the last, ever, ever after that, soon after the, although China spoke about the dragon and the elephant dancing together, and we also spoke about that there is going to be a reset of relations. And all this was going on. China was furiously creating a lot of military infrastructure on the Doklam Plateau itself. All of this is available in the, do, in the open domain. India internally maintained that Doklam was a great victory from the point of view of that narrow area where we had stopped them. They didn't build the road, that was true. But if you look at those pictures now, China has obviously increased its capacity to use that area because that area is one of the places where a major Chinese offensive could possibly cut off the Siliguri corridor which connects India to its Northeast. It is a strategic sensitivity that we cannot ignore. But what happened was that probably Chinese realized that the Indian political leadership had maintained it as a victory, despite all these. There were no protests on this building of this infrastructure. So whatever the Chinese do, as long as the military, the political leadership could maintain a facade within its own population that nothing much has happened, we can continue to do this and keep achieving our objectives. Now, this is an assumption and a supposition that I think what the Chinese took away from Dokla. And then in 2020, was what the Chinese, on the pretext of an exercise, came in, never went back. And pre that, there were also some face-offs in the, in the Northern Bank and in some other places, there was a sense of an aggressive mood which was there. And now, the Chinese came in and in certain places, never went back. But this time, Chinese miscalculated on one issue, and which was something which happened, which I would attribute to Clausewitz's notion of friction in conflict, especially when military troops are engaged and in close contact. All sort of funny things can happen, happen which cannot be imagined. They did not calculate for something like Galwan. Initially, they thought that they had succeeded when the prime minister to the parliamentary committee made those uh, remarks that nobody has come and no land has been lost. But unfortunately, that was upended by the fact that Galwan happened. And Galwan happened not because of any intentional uh, actions on both the sides, but the fact is it happened. And when it happened, casualties took place on the Indian side and so on the Chinese side, which they would never admit how much they are. 
But the fact is that that incident therefore put the government in a position where they had to acknowledge the Chinese aggression and also there was there was there was no doubt left in the minds of india's decision makers and the first sign of that regarding china and the first sign of that was we jumped into the waters of the quad which we had been hesitating for quite some time ever since india has probably achieved clarity of China's intentions. And India knows that as far as the northern borders are concerned, we would have to defend it. Nobody will come and fight for ourselves. We can best expect probably some intelligence or something like that. And obviously, we also help to, to improve our material and equipment capacity. Well, more than that, we have to carry that heavy weight. But where we can, all is achieve maximum cooperation is in the maritime arena. And that is why the flurry of naval exercises, joint multinational in many territories have been increasing in the, increasing in such a manner that is never seen before. Of course, these exercises have no common enemy, but there is always a message. And obviously, if you look at China's reaction to the Quad, we know that the psychological effect on China about the co growing cooperation between the US, its friends, its allies, and India, is a source of worry for them. So the question now is what is it that we can expect from China? Because after, especially after the visit of Prime Minister Modi to uh, Washington, India's conduct of the G20, China would probably be reviewing what should it now do? Because worst thing has happened to China is they have been, in psychological terms, they have been trying to, to, to project the message <coughs> that we are a big power, we are a strong power, Everybody better listen to us, especially these small guys in the middle powers themselves. That is where what they're doing. They have, they have used the power of information to actually project this image. But China's military is an untested military. If you look at its manning, its, its, uh, uh, manning conduct, you will find that China has a long way to go to prove itself but it is not going to fight the big war with anybody because it knows it can never win. There are too many people arranged against. Strategically, and its, its closest allies, the Russians, have themselves got themselves bogged down. Strategically, China would like, don't like to avoid the use of any major forms of force. In fact, if you look at the, the design of how they have uh, been using force, it is only the small stuff. It is only small stuff with the aim that they will slowly gain. That's why this idea of buffer zone, I'm not in favor of, because it means that you take, they have taken two steps forward, but you come to an agreement where he takes one step backwards and we take the one full step backwards and he gets to keep the one step. So the, uh, he, he makes these small games and his, therefore, is about showing, keeping forces which are in a manner can be applied, their forces in being, they influence you psychologically, 
but he does only the small stuff, keeping that force somewhere in the background, letting you know it's there. You guys better watch out. This is his style. So we should not be surprised, depending upon how the geopolitical uh, tensions will grow, how China's economy is going to be affected, and a whole host of other forces of what others do to China, how its relations with Europe is, how its relations with USA is. As long as we are concerned, we should be prepared that he will do the same sort of stuff to on the northern borders whenever he requires. He can do it because most of that areas of the border cannot be manned. The high altitude, the terrain is so vast. But we have one, we also have something with us, which is that we can also retaliate. We can do the same thing to him, go and occupy unoccupied spaces, which he normally does to us. He has not launched an attack against any of our forces except the Galwan clash which took place, but that is not to be considered to be uh, part of a deliberate attack. The point is, we should be ready for that. And when that happens, we should not hesitate and take time, like we took time to occupy the Kailash Ranges in August, when we should have actually done it earlier. Because once we occupy the Kailash Ranges, he at least started talking. Till then, he was not willing to talk. You were saying this, this is a, this, you are the aggressors. We are just doing everything in self-defense. So we must know the nature of that state. And therefore, the game being played in the northern borders must figure in the way that we deal with China. And of course, uh, I'm sure many of you have actually dealt with China very intimately know Negotiating with China is always a drawn, drawn puzzle. They'll test you. You have to be patient. We don't need to put our, to our back to any wall. We need to first play to their strategy, not to things which we imagine that we have, you know, we got this idea, oh, they did this to us because we have, we have constructed infrastructure and they're worried that India is going to now cut off G19, you know, the highway. It's absolutely nonsensical. Because it's like saying that China is going to come across the Himalayas and actually capture the territory, then they have no idea of how difficult it is to maintain logistics across the Himalayas of a large force. So all these are military imaginations, which we should be not be so worried about in the sense that we should know what they are likely to do. Of course, in strategic terms, you can't predict everything. You must always be prepared other contingencies. I'm sure we have, we are, or we are preparing for it. So to sum up, what I want to say is China is going to calibrate the pressure on the northern borders to try and keep India not being playing a role against it within the larger geopolitical power play between West and China. That is what is its political objectives. The means that he'll use would vary. You can use military, you can use diplomatic, you can use the economic means. After all, in all this while, our economic ties have been growing but he can start using it also in many ways. So we should be prepared. And therefore, it is better that we remember that in this world, there are no permanent friends, no permanent enemies. We might be tilting towards the West and the US, but I would think that that tilt should be, have a cautionary tale about it, that we should never become part of any camp we can we should we can sit in the same tent on a particular issue which is contextual. We can do that even with China on a particular issue, or even with United States on a particular issue. So, uh, as of now, for a fair and open Indo-Pacific, we seem to be sitting in the tent of the United States, and that is worrying China. So, on that note, uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you. 
Thank you, thank you very much, General. That's a, that's a quite a quite a fascinating um, kind of a, a, you know a journey you've taken us through. And with to as you mentioned, this is basically a mind game, the psychological kind of uh, uh, kind of constant psychological pressure that is being put. Put my point. Let me before I uh, I ask for questions, etc. May I just make some comments and perhaps seek your uh, you know your response to some points. One is uh, this idea of keeping pinch points, pressure points, in order to keep the pressure on India. How much do you think that it can be controlled at any time? One, it also involves uh, equal amount of assets being deployed on the Chinese side on a continuous basis. Of course, the pressure, the cost of that in terms of extending itself all the way up here is is there, and I suppose uh, they are prepared to pay it. But more than that, what are the possibilities of them of these things getting out of control? Uh, can it be, you know, how calibrated can be, and can China afford a setback? These are the things which I think, you know, for us it's not important that you know they have a complete defeat. Even a small setback for China will be a huge reputational damage to them. And that I think is very important for them. Secondly, the fact is that in terms of playing the mind game, I think of most countries that China has dealt with, perhaps with India, they've always, you know, I think they do occasionally appear to be on the defensive in the sense that they tend to treat uh, Indian, um, let's say, their Indian interlocutors with a certain amount of derision at times, a kind, kind of cultural kind of superiority or patronizing kind of thing. But I think civilizationally, they recognize that the only civilization that can be at least of equal uh, uh, level of theirs, and in fact, in some respects, they've culturally recognized even India as superior in many respects in a cultural fashion. But I think they are, they, I do, I do think that they have respect for the Indian mind, the capacity of the Indians to be able to return the same kind of intricate logic and the same kind of responses. And if anything, if the Indian policymakers have proved anything, it is that despite the kind of things you said, the response that India has done in terms of the Quad, et cetera, have only proved that we can actually go one step, two steps, even three steps ahead without necessarily going the whole hog and showing ourselves as having been actually entered any camp. This has been also proved very interestingly by the G20 uh, recently in the, in the way in which we have conducted the, 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 whole, uh, the whole conference. And from that point of view, I wonder if this attempt at them to play the mind game, they would not find themselves at some stages in a sense, uh, upstaged at some stage, is there any sense in their mind that they will, they can be upstaged by uh, the Indian fund, physical presence, our capacity to stay where we are, and secondly, to be occasionally to take an upper, an upper hand. We did that before the Rajiv Gandhi visit, as you know, by the Jaya and Negi posts in the Wangdung thing, which actually pushed them back later. This has happened uh, in, in terms of the Kailash Ranges in, in the latest thing post Galvan. And I don't think that they can take for granted that they can keep India completely on tenterhooks psychologically. This has in some ways also been uh, in, recognized in a recent article where, by in the, uh, in the CIIS, when the, the Asia Pacific Institute of the CIIS, Lanji and Shui has recently complained that the, you know, India is actually trumpeting US and Western positions, and it is actually uh, using uh, you know, multilateral mechanisms to boost, to, to prevent uh, the China's rise as a great power. And uh, that they, you know, India is conniving with the West to dislodge China from positions in the global supply chain. It talks about digital suppression and things like that. I don't know whether all this is actually, you know, will give them some kind of a, a, a kind of a pause in terms of is this 
mind game actually working or are they still completely convinced that the military that this military uh, kind of uh, this military stratagem is going to work in any case is there is, is there any scope for them to keep up and down i was wondering whether that is is a possibility and in if that is the case then we can see we can think in terms of a possibility of some kind of a even a status quo ante coming back in terms of the eastern ladakh uh, lac situation but that doesn't seem to happen at, at that doesn't there's no indication at all of that happening at this stage that is one question i would like to uh, to ask you the second question is why is china so in a sense so defensive even in terms of cultural aspects in terms like vasudeva kutumbakam they actually seem to have a, po a problem with even the that as in as a, as a, as a motto for india and uh, they have their own kind of sense of uh, you know they building of the community of shared or future for mankind the, the uh, common destiny they talked about the people centric approach modi talks about a human centric approach why is there a kind of a is there a sense of uh, of again timidity or a, a sense of defensiveness about soft power in, in india being applied in the larger context internationally by india is that also a kind of a problem which we can generate which a kind of a, a pressure which we can generate in terms of psychological of responding psychologically to china and that's the second question the third one is what do you make of the latest uh, changes in the defense ministry and uh, lin or li jiang fu's li shang fu's kind of not being uh, you know around recently his disappearance from public view whether that actually reveals any kind of a problem or dissonance in the top leadership of the party and the pla that's uh, just some of these comments for you before i ask uh, uh, i I'd ask uh, uh, for the questions to be read out okay so the first question about the possibility of china changing its mind is there a possibility? Of course, there is a possibility. I mean, we, we or we or we cannot be sure whether there is a possibility, but that possibility always would be would exist. But I think the the question to ask would probably be what should would make that possibility happen? I mean, that, that's where it is. Uh, if China continues on the trajectory on which it is embarked, which is about uh, showing its strength, sharpening its military and all other instruments of power as a coercive force, and know that at some point or the other, there would be a showdown, but in the hope that as time goes by, a little time over, the US itself with its internally uh, uh, fraying political situation and if they fraying into allies of allied system of the US, China could probably hope that they can maintain this trajectory and get away. But it has to make this decision only after it realizes that it needs to change. But they don't need to change it, uh, the trajectory. They can adopt a tactical stance for a temporary period of wanting to show that we are willing to actually get into a dialogue we need they need to sort of bring the temperatures down at the global level they can do all that and to expect that the china will give up its path in the long term i think would be unreasonable for the simple fact that as long as xi jinping is there and he has probably the presidentship for life i mean that is the legal position we can we should when we are looking at china we should we should think that there might be a temporary change of mind by china but in the long term the nature and the trajectory china has adopted is unlikely to change if it does it will be make it very interesting for us because then and as we talk about uh if both these us and china actually gets on somehow on the similar table, 
then what will it mean for us is the other question which we'll have to ask ourselves. So the, if these are not easy questions which, which might make things difficult for us. So the other question about soft power. There is no doubt that obviously China, what China lacks and despite all its this thing and its, its, its proclivity to remain aloof from the rest, the fact that it, it's, it's got uh, its uh, language issues and the arrogance of power by which it shows itself in other countries, China has found it very difficult to actually use soft power because it has got very little on its kitty. kitty. It is preferred to always use the economic instrument to buy up the leaderships of the countries concerned and they can do then whatever they want to do. And that is what has been their style. Whereas Indians on the other hand, have a different and the way of But I wouldn't, I wouldn't give soft power <coughs> so much of a, 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 a credibility in terms of <coughs> on which we can rely because eventually everybody will act on their own interests. And that would actually be kept in mind. So. Uh, it is better not to gamble on it, but it will stay. We must take it as a as a plus point, which Indeed. as a plus, but not something to be relied on. The third question about the defense minister. I think we should be asking now that the defense minister and the foreign ministers have both done the disappearing act. <laughs> there must be something seriously wrong out there. That is for sure. There must be something seriously wrong. Obviously, they have fallen foul of Xi Jinping. Why they have fallen foul is they would have protested something which Xi Jinping wants to do or carry out, which they probably did not want to do. Thank you. Thank you. No, no, I think that would probably give you an idea. <laughs> that, yeah, Thank uh, you. This gives an indication of what is happening inside China. Thank you. Thank you, General. I think that there are two raised hands, and I think I'll give them in the order in which they've appeared. Alka and then Ashok. Uh, Alka, can you speak? Uh, can you give? Can, 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 can Alka be uh, uh, unmuted? Yeah. I can't. Sir, Alka, ma'am, has left. Okay. Okay. Then Ashok, Ashok, go ahead. Uh, uh, thank, thank, thank you, General Menon, for that uh, you know, excellent presentation. Uh, you know, I'm uh, essentially in agreement uh, with your interpretation, uh, so I can only you know, uh, probe you further for elaboration of some points. Uh, uh, one uh, as to why Chan has decided to, to you know, uh, move into certain areas uh, in Eastern Ladakh, uh, or essentially initially in the guise of an exercise uh, and state put. Uh, I agree with you that uh, they're using uh, border as a pressure point. They would like to keep us bogged down uh, along Northern borders uh, and thereby also ensure that uh, we can't devote attention resources to maritime dimension of of our you know, contention with, uh, with China, where they are a little more vulnerable compared to land border. Uh, there is also messaging, as you pointed out, that uh, you know, uh, our US can only provide limited support, that we have to deal with China on our own. Perhaps there is messaging to USA also. Uh, one additional point I would like you to you know, uh, consider is uh, I tend to take uh, Chinese uh, territorial claims very seriously, uh, whether those claims be in Eastern Ladakh or in Natcha Pradesh. Uh, uh, they are uh, deliberately making changes on the ground. And the fact that you pointed out Doklam, I entirely agree with, with uh, what, what you said, uh, including you know, uh, the reading of our mindset our uh, pro proclivity to declare victory too soon. Uh, 
without you know looking at you know what will happen down the road there so they read that uh, perhaps correctly in 2017 and they went ahead uh, right to make changes on the ground so their territorial claims you know may, now they are you know sort of not making a distinction between lac and boundary you know lac was without prejudice to respective position boundary question but now lac related claims are also been linked to not ceding an inch of territory so i think that aspect we need to take seriously because it has uh, significant and implications elsewhere so this was just one thought i wanted to leave with you perhaps seek your comment uh, uh, but I have two questions, essentially. One, uh, now that uh, we are uh, sort of, you know, uh, uh, left with a new normal uh, along the borders with China, especially in Eastern Ladakh, with borders which have become live with heavy deployment on both sides. Uh, uh, do you think this deployment uh, needs to continue? Uh, you might have seen a recent article by General uh, M. M. Narwane in the print, where he argues that we should maintain heavy deployment along the LAC because for several reasons, we actually don't have a luxury of strategic depth vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. So this is one point I wanted that looking ahead, should we maintain you know, a heavy deployment a relatively heavy deployment, uh, even if there is uh, uh, some modicum of disengagement along so-called friction points. Also, keeping in mind the fact that, uh, you know, in terms of natural terrain, uh, in terms of the induction induction time on two sides, we are at a disadvantage vis-a-vis uh, -vis China, major disadvantage. This one question. My second question was that, uh, uh, What's your risk assessment about uh, China pulling through something similar elsewhere, uh, especially in the Eastern sector? Uh, as you rightly pointed out, you know, we have limited ability to, to sort of uh, uh, patrol uh, effectively all the areas given uh, our resource constraint, given nature of terrain. Uh, there are large chunks of uh, territory along the LAC or boundary in Arunachal Pradesh, uh, where we have no presence. Uh, at best, we have you no know, long range patrolling. What is your risk there, risk assessment there? Because you know, uh, given uh, pattern of Chinese behavior, uh, we should not be sort of uh, uh, unmindful of uh, such a threat. So these que two questions, uh, one comment on salience of uh, territorial claims uh, in respect to LAC as well, and two questions on uh, how do we, uh, do we need to maintain, you know, a relatively heavy deployment along the LAC uh, over a longer period, and two, you know, risk of something like Eastern Ladakh happening in, in Eastern sector as well. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Nantham. Um, in fact, the, China has actually, you know, passed a law where actually there's no compromise on sovereignty. So they've sort of drawn the line uh, very, very thickly. Uh, legally, they have they've said that there's no way that we'll compromise on anything. So they have actually thickened the plot and that we'll have to deal with. So there's no, no, no question that the boundary issue and its claims uh, have, will continue to remain. I do not see any possibility that we can possibly come to an agreement on this, which will, will, see, will bring us any sort of what we want, lasting peace, unlikely. There would probably be agreement on uh, moving forces back at best so that what we call de-escalation and disengagement, and that's about all. But China has, at this point in their forward movement of their history, has not, I mean, they have no interest in settling any of these, even if we were to give and they were to get. That is not why China is at this point in time. The second issue is about uh, the former chief's uh, 
article in the print and the heavy deployment should continue. And the, firstly, of course, I, I uh, the heavy deployment to continue would be a matter of the guys who are now the practitioners making the decision based on what they actually assess as the risk. It's very difficult to me as to how that would be. From a military point of view, we know, and you what, what I'm just enforced, reinforcing what you said, that there are many places along this border which are obviously nobody is there. China is also closer to the LAC because of it is, because of the terrain and the fact that it has been roads and lines of communication. We are still further off. They could come and sit there and keep sitting there, take control of the territory. But we have, as I said before, the only thing which is in our hands that we do a similar thing to them elsewhere, and that is highly possible. And as uh, so, uh, the chair said, that even if we do a smaller step than what we did, it will still be a big loss of face for China. But my submission is that it will happen, and that's where your next question, and it will happen most probably in the Eastern sector, because that is, again, a much larger sector and where the, the, uh, uh, the potential for such sort of things are much greater, then no, no, it's not that we can go and take back what they've taken. We can also go and pinch or bite back in other places. And that's how, how we should play the game because he must know, and probably after Kailash, he would probably be wary of this because he himself cannot guard the entire border. There are enough places by which we would, I mean, this is now the bread and butter of the operational planners of the armed forces. I'm sure they would be doing their job. And I'm, I'm sure the only thing is the political decision making on the counteraction should be as fast as possible. Thank you. Uh, you know, if chair permits, can I just ask one follow up question? Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, uh, Ashok. Uh, uh, you know, General Menon, uh, uh, you know, two examples which were given one by Ambassador Nambia, one by, by you. Uh, Ambassador Nambia referred to J.I. Negi, you know. Uh, uh, what happened in 1986 after Chinese uh, uh, moved into Sumdurongchu Valley and Namkachu Valley. Uh, at that time, uh, Chinese were really caught by surprise by our response. You know, the fact that uh, we inducted a large amount number of troops uh, along our Tungla, Lungrola, Sulla ridge line and even on the northern uh, slopes of the, of the, of the ridge line, Jaya and Negi being uh, two examples. Uh, uh, we stay put there, actually. We stay put uh, uh, in, in, on that ridge line. Uh, Kalash range uh, example you gave, uh, it was uh, actually on our side of the LAC. So it was not, uh, technically, it was not a quid pro quo operation. Uh, besides, uh, no, we didn't control all the uh, high points along Kalash range. They controlled some, we controlled some. Unlike uh, what we did uh, in uh, in uh, uh, you know uh, uh, south of Thagla Ridge uh, in the eastern sector, where we stayed put on on the parallel ridge line, and we do that uh, even part of our disengagement, which was carried out only in 1995, we didn't make any concession. In Kalash Range, we have withdrawn troops, so we have actually vacated those heights even though they were on our side of the LAC. Uh, so my point is, uh, I suspect that uh, Chinese uh, assess that we remain defensive uh, in our uh, uh, you know, posture vis-a-vis, -vis, military posture vis-a-vis -vis China, and that we have very limited appetite for quid pro, operation, quid pro quo operation, which will uh, transgress uh, our perception the LAC. Uh, what is your comment of that? No, I agree with you that, you know, the context of both these uh, in Kailash range and the Eastern sector, which happened uh, are, are two different contexts. This actually all, already, this ridge line is disputed and this is already with us. We never occupied it. When we did, it unnerved the Chinese. So the fact is the effect that it achieved with the, was the same as any quid pro quo operation would have achieved. The effect was the same. They were unnerved by the fact that we could overlook 
the Southern Bank of the Bank. So that effect is what made them start to talk. But at the price of us, as you said, vacating from our own territory. But that's a price we were willing to pay to buy the peace. And we thought that by doing that, we could probably get whole, uh, get uh, the other issues also resolved. But they said, we'll first talk about this area, then we will take the other areas later on. And you know what has happened after that. They're dragging their feet, unlikely to take it anywhere or keep the this thing one. So I, I, to, 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 re, to get to your direct question, whether they look us as, as defensive is, it is, it is about, I think they look as up that the political leadership can be put against uh, under pressure if they have to admit to their populace that territory has been lost. That I think is what is what they are going to capitalize on. So the point is, I don't see any reason why India should uh, say, it, uh, move away from the quid pro quo, which is actually uh, uh, a reaction somewhere else, not get into a fight, would that st would still be the better way to do it? But, but the Chinese, will, I'm sure, uh, must will be wary that we will do it now, and maybe the political this, this thing can no longer keep this away from its public, and therefore there are more chances of they doing it now than there was before. Thank you. I think that's a very interesting uh, response you made. Uh, I, I, I think uh, Vice Admiral Murli, then would, would you like to make a give a question? Go ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, Ambassador Vijay and uh, Menon sir. Good afternoon. Hi. Now, my question is to you: For as a counter, do you think we should do deploy more of our maritime forces? in South China Sea under the pretext of exercising with other nations in that area with whom we have been doing. Because as you know, Chinese Navy has been venturing into all our, in our region completely. Uh, they're very there with Sri Lanka. Now they set up a base in Djibouti. So isn't it time that we also showed that we have the reach through which we can do counter, or at least we can be a threat in being out of their own waters? That is one. And the other thing is a question which I've asked before, I think probably to Ambassador Nandiyar also. Uh, there was an article about a year ago by Ambassador Ghare Khan in the Hindu, where he is quoted Mrs. Gandhi as saying that, you know, say 25, 30 years down the line, we may become friendly with Pakistan, but China is a nation we can never trust and never become friendly with. What are your views on both these? Thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, the very fact that we have is we have shown our flag in the South China Sea is, I think, now they are on display. But I would like to actually at least uh, put a note of caution here that while we do this, and that is meant for signaling more than anything else, you know, uh, when it comes to blocking trades, uh, international trade routes and so on, then we are in a completely different realm of the, con I mean, it would then be conflict in that sense. We are now talking about it of the potential use of this force for that. So it is part of the greater mind game itself. But as far as India's naval power is concerned, obviously his first priority would be the Indian Ocean uh, region itself. And we should always keep open the fact that we must be able to operate in the South China Sea if it is required. That must be part of a vision. That must be where naval power should actually be uh, uh, looking at, but all this will be constrained by the resources that we can make available to the Indian Navy. Hmm. But Gare Khan's idea about, I think it is a basic violation of, I think what we should all, all accept because that is the nature of relationships that they can, at one end, could possibly be proximity, love, which gives cooperation, and the other end could be hatred and hostility, which brings all sort of conflicts into play. All relationship doesn't matter with whom it is can oscillate between these two. So to single out China as a permanent hostility, 
I do not agree with that idea. I don't think we should. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any any question, uh, Murli? Any one more? No, no more. No? Fine. So we do have certain questions yeah, in the chat box. I have the, there are three questions. The first one is is basically I think uh, uh, you know from the by Bharat, Bharat Bhatt. Uh, that's more or less. I think Arunachal is easily accessible uh, from the Chinese mainland, except that has been discussed. All uh, actually, he wants to know. Bharat wants to know why they are concentrating force in the Ladakh area. Uh, I think that has generally been covered by the uh, by the discussion in answer to uh, Ambassador Ashokan's question. So let me go to the other two which is Anil Jaising says that China has perpetuated two myths and by shaping the narrative over a sustained period has convinced itself and perhaps many in the world. The first is its civilizational credentials and the second its maritime credentials as a historical maritime power. In the contemporary scenario where shaping minds through perception management is an effective tool can India not launch a sustained counter narrative to debunk both these myths? I think that's one point. Uh, would you like to uh, respond to that? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Let me respond to this. Uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, in the sense that you know, uh, if you look at uh, China is actually uh, the latest one on the GDI, the Global Developmental Initiative and the GCI, the Global Civilizational Initiative. Uh, it, it is about, the. Uh, I mean, uh, the best thing is to tell most of the world that this is not about a fight between uh, 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 a Chinese civilization or another civilization. It is not about a class of civilization. It is, it is about the fact that all civilizations have to coexist and, and sort of balance each other and merge and then get the best out of it. But the point is that the civilizational argument and is, is, is embedded in a larger notion to tell also most, especially the ones who have been colonized for a long time, the Western past, ki what the Westerners have done, done to them, don't you ever forget it. And that's one of the messages which they have been sending in Africa, uh, even to the rest, and they probably uh, try to give us the same, this thing that, you know, we are the victims, we actually should get back where we are. They have this uh, going back in terms of history, going back to where they actually belong. So these are the guys who actually done this to us. So we need to actually take back what actually belongs to us. So the civilization is what they perpetuate for themselves. Because it's like China's view of the global order. It talks about multipolarity, but if you really look at it, it's finally about China's multipolarity, but he's the guy who's actually got a made saint making the rules. I mean, that's the way that China looks at it. Look at the Asian centric. It's about a xenocentric Asian order, which China is actually visualizing. So the point that is this, the myths that it has, and of course, the maritime myth and completely in agreement, they have never been a maritime power of any consequence, but yet they have managed to to convince themselves and, and for or for the at least the strategic cognizant of world over couldn't possibly be convinced that China has never been there. And if you speak to the Navy and they'll tell you how long does it take to actually develop and become a maritime power. It's like, you know, the Leoning has actually gets ready. China makes sure that it's shown to the world and then it says that it has become operational. I think the naval guys will tell you how long it takes for guys to actually learn how to operate it, how will the pilots get used to it in the choppy seas? I mean, it's it's a several years process. Whereas China has just what it's telling us with all its equipment. It's like, it's got very high tech equipment. Okay, there's no doubt about it. It's got, uh, I mean, some of it, of course, completely untested. Now it's got people out there in that who are, who are actually at the lower end and some of them have to, uh, uh, to manage this are there for two years, only two years. Now, if for two years, you can learn how to manage this high-tech equipment, 
You might be, a, I mean, you have to be a guy which is not is much above the normal. So these are the things which Chinese would probably to hide. That is why China will not get into a big fight. China will avoid the big fight. China will actually want to use force to affect the decision making without using force. And that's what Sun Tzu actually has perpetuated. Don't, you should be able to win without fighting. Fine. Uh, one, uh, thank you. I, I think there's one more question in the chat box, and that is Kesha Patmanabhan's uh, question. He's from the print. Uh, my question, he says, is how much of China's motivation for the creation of pinch points also stems from their own internal issues, specifically their economic slowdown? Recent reports, he said, suggest that wages in Shanghai and Beijing have been falling between six to nine percent year on year. So. How likely would China use its military as an instrument to reduce the pressure on the CCP internally while also costing India's resources to answer to China's provocations? That's his first question. The second question, if you or would you like to respond to that first and then yeah, let me just respond to this. Okay, very good. Uh, you know, I, I think we are still in the early days of China's economic slowdown. There are a lot of guys who are actually predicting uh, that this is this is the beginning of the end, but I think we are jumping the gun. And I think that will have no influence on the pinch points because he's already got the forces, he's created the infrastructure, he's got people there, he can easily do it without any additional expenditure to himself. The expenditure will be mostly incurred by us. So I think that, that, that should be very clear. Yeah, the second question. Yeah, the second question is, is uh, would it would be a bit theoretical, he says, would it also be time for India to consider a strategic response revol revolving around the idea of command of the commons, which was a buzz within the US military in the early part of the first decade of the 21st century. Should we focus on strategic means to command certain part of the commons, land, sea, air, information, and space, rather than try to compete with China on all the areas? I think, you know, uh, that will be the rise of uh, India if we have the capability to command as a hegemon, because this will be completely against international norms and law. And the command of the hegemons is what the military wants, the US military wants, and especially they wanted to do it in space and so on. So I think we should probably keep that idea at rest. For another day. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We've not yet reached that, that stage, as it were. Okay. Uh, then the last question in the chat box is from Nirmal Panda, who says, can you throw some light on our capabilities of creating pinpoints for China in the middle sector in places like Shipkila and Lipulik? Should India think of doing that? I think that's an operational question. We better leave that alone. I'm sure the guys who are in charge would probably knowing what to do when it has to be done. We have just a message from Alka apologizing because she's had to apparently leave. Uh, she's had to, uh, she has a meeting, she's logged off. Thank you. Is there any other, uh, Ms. Singh, is there any other question which you have found? Is there any other, any other raised hands? I can't see um, any. Sir, there are some questions from our YouTube channel uh, okay. during the live. Why don't you Can read I... that to me? Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, so this is question by Colonel uh, Vinay Jasotia. Uh, he says, he asks, uh, you alluded about three options, till to China, neutral and till to US, but didn't elaborate cost benefit for choosing what they choose. So I don't know if like this is a question, but yeah. No, could you please repeat the last part? I mean, what is the question? Uh, yeah, uh, he says, you alluded about three options, till to China, neutral and till to US but didn't elaborate cost benefit for choosing what they chose. Yeah, actually you'll have to call me for a separate lecture to answer that question. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Any, any, but I think that's far too, far too, far too big, uh, big too, too broad uh, question. Any, any further question, Ashna? Ashna, would you like to unmute or is there any question? Yes. Uh, no, sir. As of now, no. Okay, so I think we are in any case we're reaching uh, four thirty. So it's a, it's a been a. Uh, let me see. I can't see any further question. 
So I don't think that, it, you know, there is a, I don't think I can, um, I can, you know, I, I would be able to encapsulate the discussion, but obviously we've had a very rich uh, debate. Let me say one thing which, uh, which uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the general has made, made very clear that China does not want to have a, a war an all out war, because I don't think it will particularly in the maritime field seg seg uh, segment, there is really not, you know, it wouldn't want to burst the bubble. So it would seek maximally victory without war. And that is in keeping with its tradition. Second, there is no prospect of a settlement, as it were. At best, you could have marginal de escalation. And that's what we can expect in the present forces, in the present. Uh, circumstances but even over even from that angle i think the general has been saying that we should be careful we should be vigilant that there could be retaliation and this time possibly even in the eastern sector so uh, it could well happen but he has of course mentioned that on our side too we are pretty uh, I, I think we're pretty well prepared to think in terms of and to be able to respond at certain other sectors, which will give us advantage. And therefore, that could be a potential deterrent for China to launch any kind of provocation by raising issues in areas which have hitherto not been uh, areas of major, major uh, any, any differences. At, at, but at the same time, we do expect that the larger psychological game, the larger pressures on India, particularly in terms of the pressures on India's economic resources to be able to keep uh, our own uh, uh, sort of uh, our deployments at the levels that we will require at this, at this stage, in this stage of our confrontation with China, uh, that would create sufficient amount of pressure they feel for us to be able to counter, to at, at least to inhibit us from a rather much more proactive and uh, uh, major investment in terms of our increasing our maritime strength. I wonder if that broadly would, uh, in a sense, encapsulate the major arguments. But this has been an excellent and a very, very stimulating uh, discussion, General Prakash Menon, and we'd like to thank you for uh, this very a uh, broad spectrum and at the same time, very directed, focused kind of attention on how China is using the, uh, the tensions in the northern border as part of the larger strategy, which it has in coping with the only other uh, Asian power that it sees at the present moment, which may stand in the way of its becoming the perhaps uh, the most considerable uh, Asians power in the coming uh, decades, as it were. Uh, as we see the, uh, the economic situation, as you said, the economic power of China, people have been talking about uh, relative diminution in its, uh, the problems that it is facing, but this is still a long way. And I think the, the, uh, the, 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 the the national the comprehensive national strength that it has accumulated over the past few decades, two decades at least, uh, is still considerable. And I think there are still issues which a country like India will have to take into account when it talks about trying to keep, uh, to cope with this particular uh, major uh, problems which we have with China. I hope that, uh, uh, that is there any other point which you would like to add, uh, General, at this stage? Uh, otherwise, we can... Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everybody. And I think this will probably bring uh, us to a, bring this discussion, this webinar uh, to a close. Thank you. Thank you, so, Prakash, sir. Thank you, Vijay, yeah, sir. I just, yeah. Okay. So okay. with this, uh, we come to uh, the end of the session. Uh, thank you, Lieutenant General Prakash Menon and Ambassador Nambia for giving us your precious time. The video of today's discussion will be available on the ICS YouTube platform. We would also like to welcome everyone for the book discussion happening tomorrow.
that is 15th of September on the book, Locating Bricks in the Global Order, Perspectives from the Global South, featuring a panel of distinguished professors from Jawaharlal Nehru University and ICS. You can also subscribe to our newsletters for regular updates. Thank you.